that's more effective than shut them. Blank up sometimes. Uh, but whatever works. Uh, well, good evening, you all. Come on in. Again, I know some of you are trying to grab your seats. Some of you are still going through security. Please, come on in. we got to get started, folks. So you all, please, come on in. Find a spot and quiet down for... Are those pink shorts? Uh, Y'all, come on in, quiet down, find a spot, and we will get started. I'm going to start calling some of y'all by name. Please, sit down. Thank you very much. NABJ 2012, now you can make some noise. How you doing? <laughs> this one's going to be a little different this year. Uh, certainly for me, I don't mind admitting, I've been coming to these a long time. This is NABJ right here. This is the blackest I have ever been at an NABJ. Oh, I still work for a three-letter network. Different three letters now. And that first letter stands for black. So this one's going to be a little different. Uh, I didn't know it's been 20 years. Maurice was telling me this, 20 years since we were since we've been to New Orleans for NABJ, is that right? 29, 29 years. So I don't know what the hell was going on 29 years ago. We didn't get invited back. But let's not replicate whatever behavior that was. Really, you all remember when you're out this week, you're representing yourselves, your networks, and you are representing NABJ while you're here. So please, keep that in mind. Have a good time, yes. A good rule of thumb, if you're out in the wee hours of the morning and you still see me, it's probably time for you to go home. Um, as you all may have noticed, there was some extra security outside a little bit that wasn't just there because of uh, us. Um, the Vice President, of course, uh, is going to be here shortly. You will hear from him. Um, President Obama was not able to make it. There was a scheduling issue, so he could not make it. But we asked for the next best thing, and Michelle couldn't make it either. So. No, we, we got Vice President Biden, and please, when he comes up, it's an absolute honor and a treat to have him, so please give him the office, uh, the respect and the attention, certainly he, did, uh, he, he deserves, and we are honored to be here, uh, for him to be here. Also, you're going to hear from Grammy Award Willie Mel Melanie Fiona, he's going to be here with us tonight. Also, they call him D-Nice, he's handling the DJ duties for us this evening at this opening party, which of course is powered by the BET Network. So we are ready to get this thing started. Thank you all so much. Um, and let's start off, I want you all to hear from the chair of the 2012 NABJ, Rod Hicks, and also from the New Orleans chapter president, Nicondra Norwood, welcome them up. Good afternoon, my NABJ family. I am so happy to be in New Orleans, you cannot believe. Thank you for inviting us back after 29 years, and we are so happy to be here, and we have so much planned. I tell you, we have packed so much in the schedule, you will leave here very pleased. Nicondra, it is so good working with you. Well, it has been a pleasure. Most of the time. <laughs> we have been back and forth getting this thing together. It's been a short period of time, but looking around the room, looking around the hotel today, I don't think that we are missing too many. So, so happy to be able to be a part of this, to host you all. And some of you might have seen me walking around with a scowl on my face. It's because I am determined to make sure that everything that has to do with the New Orleans chapter goes great. Like our public forum last night, it was a... Uh, fantastic event and hopefully a lot of you that were not around can check it out online. It will be posted tomorrow with a link from NOABJ.org. So we kicked it off like that and there's going to be more of that kind of thing going on for the rest of the week. So thank you for being here. Look forward to seeing you around and les les bon temps One of the things that I want to remind you of in the programming that we have, we have a lot, really a lot. And we, we actually had an opening day this year with a lot. We're still going to do a, a panel to, uh, focus on uh, writing for Hollywood. Tomorrow morning, bright and early, 8 o'clock, we're going to kick out our professional development practices. And as an incentive for coming, you have an opportunity to win an iPad 
or a, um, a Kindle Fire. So we will see you at uh, tomorrow morning. It's going to be about energizing communities, and there are others on uh, Friday, and I think there's one on Saturday as well. But come to the uh, professional development breakfasts, and maybe you'll walk away not only with the information, but with an iPad and a Kindle Fire. See you tomorrow morning. Thank you, NABJ. Smart man, right? He said 8 o'clock in the morning, y'all go, ooh, iPad, ah. Good call, right? Um, a couple of notes you all need to know about the uh, vice president when he does come out to address us. Do not rush the front of this stage to try to get pictures. Um, your NABJ 2012 will end quickly. So again, do not, there's a barrier here. Take the pictures from where you are, but do not rush up here. It, they don't play, all right? Um, uh, next up, uh, one of, someone who has really been so supportive, you all know and know well over the years, who has really supported NABJ, serving as the honorary chair uh, this year, and also a, a major sponsor, but has really given so much, so much back to NABJ over the years, and also has just been a leader in newsrooms and in corporate boardrooms, literally, for years and years and years. You all give her the, 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 the applause she deserves right now. Please welcome up, Paul Mess. I want to, first of all, thank you so much for turning out. You remember last year, my angry bad girl speech was that we needed to show up in New Orleans and we needed to show up strong because there was an expectation that because we withdrew ourselves from a particular dance, that we might not have any real dance partners going forward. So I'm happy to tell you that as of this morning, not this evening, but this morning, officially, there are 2,200 registrants for NABJ this year in New Orleans. Now, the significance of that, the significance of that is remember, what we talked about was whether or not we were going to be able to recover quickly. We weren't going to go to that convention in, New Orleans, in uh, Las Vegas, and we had to pull this together. So, the, first of all, the New Orleans chapter should get a big round of applause for making this happen in New Orleans two years earlier than was originally planned. I'm here from around the world. There are journalists from Ghana. There are journalists from South Africa, from Canada. There are journalists who have come here to partner with us. And so this, as you know, internationalism and globalism is a very important part of what I want to focus on. And it is all about me. No, seriously. But this year, what we've been able to do is expand our reach even more and welcome many more journalists who are of the African diaspora into NABJ. Speaking of the African diaspora, you know that my family owns the Africa Channel, which you can see here in New Orleans uh, on Cox Cable. And we are at booth 400 at the job fair. Uh, the, the, the big thing for us that I wanted to let you all know about tonight is that uh, the Africa Channel is sponsoring a NASCAR team. Right. The car is down. The car is... Uh, at the job fair, you'll be able to see it tomorrow, and we're also going to introduce you to an African-American female driver who... <laughs> who likes really fast cars. So my message to you is, you're going to party tonight, I understand that. That's the way we like to wrap up every evening at NABJ. But it is vitally important that you get up in the morning and your eyes are not bloodshot and that you attend the meetings, the breakfast, do what you're supposed to do here at NABJ. Network, help other people, introduce journalists to other opportunities, and above all, congratulate each other for making it one more year as a black person in a newsroom that hopefully is becoming more and more welcoming to us as African Americans. There are 20 of you present whose heritage will be revealed during the course of the convention. 
uh, again, my belief, my family's belief that if we know where we come from, then it helps us chart our future. So there are 20 of you who we have sponsored having their DNA tests. We will be revealing them throughout the convention. Please, please, please come to the workshop. And importantly, even if you didn't win an opportunity to have your DNA done, do it for yourself and for your family. I have on my Ghanaian print. Because, as I said in the program book, you can call me Paula Madison, or you can call me Nana Akosu Abanie, which is my Ghanaian Ashanti name. I welcome everybody to New Orleans, and again, 2200 as of this morning, there is a really good chance that we could set a record here. So call your friends, Facebook your peeps, and tell them to get here. Thank you. Um, but really, that was so much there, and, and even NASCAR, she hit on NASCAR. You know what Chris Rock says, black folks, basketball, football, tennis, golf, track. When they make a heated hockey rink, we're going to take that sport, too. We might do NASCAR first, though. That might be next on the list. So thank her. She always, always fires up her crowd. Now, again, for some logistics here, uh, we're about to take about a 20-minute break, and then we will start the vice president's portion of the program. Again, as a reminder, you will not be able to get up and move around, and please don't come up here and try to take pictures. You have been warm. So, you all hang tight. Please enjoy the conversation, the food, and the drink. 20 minutes, roughly. We'll see you. Our theme this year is new platforms, 
new directions, new Orleans. Many of this week's sessions will focus on the changing landscape and how we, can, how we journalists can survive in this ever turbulent industry. As we come together this week, we cannot overlook the events that occurred last week at my home paper, The Times Picayune, a 175 year institution where they laid off 200 employees. That's half of the workforce. New Orleans now becomes the largest metro area in the nation without a daily newspaper in this digital age. The economy has hit all industries very hard. Journalism is no exception. We're deep into the 2012 campaign for the presidency, and it would not be a true enemy convention if we did not hear for those who wish to gain or keep the White House, especially to hear their views on the issues that impact us the most, the economy and the job loss. It's definitely something we have our eyes on as journalists. Joining us tonight to address our organization is a man who was a state of Delaware's longest serving U.S. Senator, a man with deep insights into what it takes to govern, and a man who's seeking his second term as Vice President of the United States. It is my distinct honor to introduce the 47th President of the United States, Joseph R. Uh, 47th President of the Vice President of the United States. Mr. President, thank you very much. <laughs> it's an honor to be invited to speak before all of you. Uh, the, uh, be careful, microphones are always hot. <laughs> And understand that in Washington, D.C., a gap is when you tell the truth, so be careful. <laughs> Do not tell the truth. <laughs> hey, folks, it's, it's an honor to be here. It really, really is. Look, I know you're all busy and you got a lot to do, and this is a great town. It's the best when the event ends. And so I'm not going to try to keep you too long from this great town. We were talking about, the President and I were talking about this town. My daughter, went to Tulane University. I was wondering if she's going to come home with somebody talking funny at me and all that, you know what I mean? And, and, uh, she loved the place down here so much it worried the hell out of me. Uh, but, um, but it's a great city and it's coming back. I just spent some time with, with Mayor Landrieu. Uh, he met me at the airport and uh, I'm doing a great job. Uh, and I think the city needs a little more help, but that's another story. Folks, look, uh, to state the obvious, this is a consequential election. Two parties uh, are offering starkly different alternatives in how to proceed, how to build America in the 21st century, on foreign policy, on social policy, and most of all, on economic policy. And tonight, I want to talk to you about what I consider to be the choices that are at hand in each of those areas, the distinctions between Governor Romney and uh, President Obama, between the Republicans in the Congress and those of us uh, uh, in the White House. I don't have to remind you what we inherited. My dad used to say, Joey, never explain and never complain. This is neither an explanation or, or a complaint, but it's a reality. The middle class, the middle class was in free fall. Nine million Americans lost their jobs. Sixteen trillion dollars in wealth evaporated. Some of the wealth you all had in your home, your home equity, your 401k programs, they went up in smoke. At the same time this was happening, the top 1% grew by more than 275% the last decade to an average of $1.3 million per year. And that wealth didn't trickle down. There's no evidence that it created jobs. On top of that, we had a foreign policy where we were no longer respected by our allies and we weren't feared by our enemies. And we were nearly two decade, a decade into two wars. 180,000 combat troops deployed in harm's way. Osama bin Laden remained at large and plotting new attacks on the United States of America. So I think it's fair, I think it's fair to look at and judge how we responded to that circumstance and how Governor Romney, where he's spoken to it, says he would have responded. Because past many times is prologue. Here's what the President and I did in the immediate aftermath of the crisis. We stabilized U.S. banks, which was as popular as legalizing rattlesnakes in downtown New Orleans. <laughs> you think I'm kidding? 
We unfroze the credit markets. We injected demand back into the economy. We rescued the automobile industry, and instead of losing a million jobs, the auto industry has created 200,000 jobs since then. And General Motors, General Motors is once again leading the world, and Chrysler is the fastest growing automaker in the nation. Instead of a continued hemorrhage of manufacturing sector jobs, we created over half a million, or the economy has created over half a million new manufacturing jobs, the fastest growth in manufacturing since the mid-90s. We passed <clears throat> some of the toughest Wall Street regulations in history. We passed the health care reform bill, which expands access and affordable care to 30 million people. And I'm not being solicitous to this audience, but 8 million African Americans who had no access now have access. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we cut taxes. The irony is this notion that we didn't, we cut taxes 17 times on small businesses, helped hundreds of thousands of Americans modify their mortgages, cut taxes, middle class Americans with a payroll tax cut twice in a row, putting an average of 1,500 bucks in the pocket of average rent. The neighborhood I come from, 1,500 bucks a year is the difference between whether you can pay your automobile insurance, your home insurance, whether or not you can, in fact, keep your kid in the community college. We improved access to education, expanded Head Start, early childhood education. We expanded by 3 million people the number of people receiving Pell Grants, nearly half of which, I might add, are African American undergraduate students who receive that funding. We created, we created job training partnerships to get back on our feet. There are 600,000 manufacturing jobs, high-tech manufacturing jobs in America, that are going unfilled because you don't have the skills to fill them as a consequence of that word my generation heard for the past 25 to 30 years, outsourcing. We're short on tool and die makers. We're short on people with the skills to deal with these. And so we married up. We married up these manufacturing companies with community college to train, to train people for the floor. Our Governor Armley obviously wasn't president at that time. But we know what he said he would have done in a number of cases. He wouldn't have rescued the automobile industry. He preferred to let Detroit go bankrupt. He said, though, the market would take care of it. Somehow they'd step in. I didn't see anybody stepping in to rescue the market, including Bain Capital. He wouldn't have passed Wall Street reform, he said. He said so. He said, quote, we didn't need it and, quote, I'll get rid of it. In May, the Boston Globe had a story that Romney said, and I quote, it's nearly, it, I quote, is nearly silent on how, without regulation, you prevent Wall Street from once again engaging in the risky practice that would help cause the financial crisis, end of quote. We also know what he would have done in foreign policy. He said he would have kept combat troops in Iraq. It was a mistake for us to end that combat mission. He would have rejected, he said, he would reject the timetable for getting out of Afghanistan and passing on responsibility to the Afghans. He would not have, in his words, moved heaven and earth to get bin Laden. Doesn't mean he wouldn't have done what the president did, but he said he wouldn't have moved heaven and earth to do it. I promise you the president moved heaven and earth. So needless to say, needless to say, I think it's fair that we might have had a very different circumstance over the last three and a half years. <coughs> Obviously, some argue it would have been better. But on the things I mentioned, it's pretty clear there would have been a much significant difference. We can't say exactly what would have happened had he had his way. But we know the results of the President's action. Instead, we've done 25 straight months of joblessness before we took office, and the first several months after, but 20, 27 straight months private sector gains. Instead of losing 9 million jobs, and before I lowered my right hand on that magnificent day of January 20th, we already lost over 700,000 jobs that month. My deceased wife used to say the greatest ability God gave mankind was the ability to forget. And then my mother would quickly add, that's true, honey, if it weren't, we would only have one child. <laughs> Created 4.3 million jobs. By the way, more jobs in the entire than were created in the entire Bush administration. This is real measurable progress, but it's not nearly enough. We know it's not enough. 
And we believe we're moving in the right direction. So the question going forward from here is not about whether or not we have to accelerate, accelerate, accelerate growth, but how to accelerate growth in the economy. We believe the economy cannot and will not be truly healthy until the profound erosion of the middle class, middle class jobs, middle class incomes is reversed. As the President has said, this is the defining issue of our time. The decisions we make in the next few years, and this is not hyperbole, on everything from debt to taxes, energy to education, will have an enormous impact on our future. What kind of country we pass on to our children and yours? Governor Romney would take the country in a fundamentally different direction. He's very straightforward about it. These guys aren't hiding the ball. He's straightforward. His theory of the case is the way to grow the economy is from the top down. Deregulate Wall Street. Deregulate polluters. Deregulate EPA. He would continue tax cuts for millionaires. He continued the Bush tax cut for the top 2%, which cost $800 billion over the next decade. And on top of that, He'd added a $2 trillion tax cut for Americans making over a million dollars a year, an average tax cut of an additional $250,000 per year on top of those tax cuts. In order to pay for that, he says we need to adapt a budget, adopt a budget that keeps the deficit from growing more. And in the process, the budget he calls for eviscerates the very things we believe are needed to grow the economy. He and his Republican allies in the House support the Ryan budget to a person. Many of you reported on the details of the Ryan budget. So you know I'm not making up what I'm about to tell you. It eviscerates investment in things that we need, in our view, to grow the middle class. Education, innovation and research, development, infrastructure. It slashes the budget for the NIH and the National Science Foundation. It cuts Medicare, Medicaid, by $810 billion, which means 19 million people will lose access to health care. Where do they think these people will go in cities like New Orleans and Philadelphia and Los Angeles and Detroit? He cuts Head Start by 200,000 children, access by 200,000. He cuts $4.9 billion out of elementary and secondary education. It is in the fine print. I'm not making these numbers up. Now, in fairness to he and Ryan, his Republican Congress, his Republican allies in Congress, I believe they actually believe this will grow the economy. They talk about this as if it's a new idea. Ladies and gentlemen, we've seen this movie before, and we know how it ends. It ends in the middle class being eviscerated. As a recent study of the Fed points out, losing 40% of their median household wealth. A gigantic drop. Lost jobs, stagnant wages, foreclosed homes, dreams destroyed. Well, folks, we have a different way forward. Our way says we need to invest in things that are essential to grow the economy. The things that have always grown the economy in America. A better education system, investing in innovation and research and development, infrastructure, and new energy policy. That's how we've always created jobs in the past. That's how we've always moved forward. That's the story, the history, the journey of this country. And I've been around the United States Senate for a long time. I go back a long way. Matter of fact, to my chagrin, when I got elected the seventh time and I had to leave the Senate to go, we not had to, left the Senate to go to become vice president, the Senate historian came in and they do what they call the history minute in our caucuses and said, before the vice, before the vice president-elect leaves, you should understand only 13 people in American history have ever served longer than him. And I went, oh my God. <laughs> My father would define that as a misspent adulthood, but the truth is I've seen a lot. And ladies and gentlemen, of late I don't understand our Republican colleagues rejecting things that historically Republicans have supported. When the President asked me to help with the jobs bill together, 
We deliberately sat down and, went and included it in things that they've always supported, always been for. But ladies and gentlemen, there is no what you might call cooperation. We believe. And I think the vast majority of Americans, everybody has a stake, the stake the obvious, in the economic growth of this economy. But also everyone has a responsibility to get it back on its feet. And folks, that requires a tax policy that says ordinary Americans don't have to pay a higher tax than millionaires. That will not solve the budget, but you know what it will do? It will convince people in the neighborhoods I grew up in, in Scranton or Claymont or Wilmington, that this deal's on the level. Ordinary Americans, they don't mind. They don't mind. They understand they gotta make sacrifices. How many millions of Americans out there have been stagnant wages the last five or six years? But they get it. They know they have to go through it. They know they have to pay more for college. They know the things they have to do. Poor folks know that they can't get as much help as they got before. But ladies and gentlemen, there's only one group who hadn't contributed virtually anything in terms of sacrifice. And they're good people. I come from one of the richest states in America. I learned a long time ago, very wealthy people are just as patriotic, just as willing to sacrifice as anybody else. But nobody's asked anything of them. So the fact is, we think it's time not to balance the budget with the millionaire quote-unquote tax, the Buffett rule. In my neighborhood, in your neighborhoods, my guess is no one minds, as they say, giving to the office. But everybody hates being played for a sucker. Everybody hates being played for a sucker. And that's what the American people think is happening now. They think they're being played for a sucker. How do you explain? How do you explain an additional two billion, or two trillion, eight hundred billion dollars in tax cuts for the wealthiest people in America? So, ladies and gentlemen, the reason why we need a Buffett rule is just to let people know this is on the level. We think we have to eliminate elements of the tax code that no longer serve the purpose they were designed to serve, no longer are necessary. Because we've been in a lot of programs out there that were useful but no longer essential because we couldn't afford them. I love these guys. They say, how are you going to pay for this? Ask them how they're going to pay for their tax cuts. Eliminate loopholes like a $4 billion a year oil and gas subsidy. I say that in New Orleans, a state, Louisiana. But guess what? Even the oil companies don't need an incentive of $4 billion to go out and explore. As my grandpa would say, they're doing just fine, thank you. <laughs> Tax incentives that move companies abroad. It's not a lot of money, but why in the hell, why would we do that? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> CJ, be careful with these microphones. <laughs> Seriously, why would we do that? The counter argument I get for saying we should eliminate the tax credit for moving abroad is, well, it's not going to raise a lot. Why would we do that? Tell me. Why wouldn't we have a tax credit to move companies back home? I mean, I mean it's not a big deal, guys. I'm not playing a game with you. It's not a big number. But it's real. Why? We believe we have to balance our budget. The last time that was done, I might add, was under a Democratic administration. Every bipartisan plan put forward, from Simpson Bowles to Domenici Rivlin to the Gang of Six, had in essence, the essence of it, the foundation of it was, a balanced approach. I love these guys talking about Simpson Bowles. How many of them were for it? Ladies and gentlemen, Simpson Bowl said, for every $3 we cut in spending, $1 in revenue. Every one of the plans said that. 
That's the same formula we used in putting forward the plan to reduce the deficit by $4 trillion over 10 years. We can argue about whether or not our plan would work, whether it's the exact right number, but it's balanced. But Governor Romney has a fundamentally different view. There's nothing balanced about the way he views it. He reiterated again on Face the Nation with Bob Schieffer this weekend the same thing he said during the Republican debates. When asked, would you support a deficit reduction plan that was 10 to 1, $10 in cuts for $1 in revenue? And he said, no. No. Now let me ask you a rhetorical question. Those of you who run the editorial boards of your papers, do you know anybody, any reasonable economist who thinks that we can move toward, over time, rebalancing our budget without any new revenues? I don't know anybody. And I really doubt whether Romney does. But look, folks, look. Romney and, and Ryan, Republican allies, I think they're missing one big deal here. And by the way, I think they're honorable guys. I think Romney is an honorable man. I think he has a beautiful family and all this talk about his wife. Let me tell you something. I don't care if you have $500 million. When you deal with the health problems she's dealing with, it doesn't matter. They understand. But ladies and gentlemen, I don't think they, was, they understand what's happening in ordinary Americans. I really don't. I don't think they understand what's happening in our neighborhoods, the neighborhoods a lot of us grew up in. What's happening in our communities. My dad used to have an expression. He used to say, Joey, a job's about a lot more than a paycheck. It's about your dignity. It's about self-respect. It's about your sense of yourself, your place in the community. And what I don't think they get is hundreds of thousands of hardworking Americans through no fault of their own have not only lost their job, but been stripped of their dignity. You're all press. I was in the Ohio Valley a couple weeks ago along the Ohio River. They've been under siege a long time there now. And at the last step, I was in a, at a town right on the West Virginia border. And 35 minutes from Pittsburgh. And I walked in, we call it, you know, these OTRs, off the record stop, and I walked into a, to a, 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 I think it was a barbecue place. And the press went in before me, they're all lined up behind the counter, and I walk in shaking hands with the folks. I walked by and was answering questions for the press. And one guy, I could tell he was local because he was holding his own camera and had the mic. <laughs> hey guys. I'm from Delaware. We're still the only state in the nation that doesn't have their own commercial television. And he asked me a question, and I said, are you from here? And he nodded, yeah. And he's interviewing me now. And I said, I bet you know a lot of guys you grew up with who don't have jobs. He said, yeah. I said, what do you think would happen if tonight you called him and said, hey, man, I got, a, I got four tickets for the pirate game. A bunch of us are going over. You're old buddies. I said, what do you think your friend out of work would say? He didn't say anything, obviously. And I said, I bet he wouldn't go. And he nodded his head, like, and the camera says, he's nodding his head. I said, you know why he wouldn't go? Because he's ashamed. All his other friends have a job. He doesn't know what to say or do. He doesn't have a job. So he wouldn't go. You know that to be the truth. I don't think these guys get it. Tonight, I'd wager there are folks in neighborhoods you all come from that you know are going to bed tonight staring at the ceiling. I don't mean figuratively, I mean literally. When the light goes out, and their husband or wife is quiet next to them. And just stare at the ceiling wondering, am I going to be able to be in this home two months from now? Too many hardworking Americans have played by the rules, did everything they were supposed to do, and have had to make what I call the longest walk any parent ever has to make. And that's up a short flight of stairs in the kid's bedroom. 
My dad made that walk when I was in third grade in Scranton, Pennsylvania. So I got the Wilmington. You walk up to my grandpa Finnegan's house. He sat in the bed. And I remember it. It wasn't so tragic, but I remember it. He said, Joey, dad's going to have to move. I'll be gone about a year, but I'll come home almost every week. And it's only 156 miles. I'm moving to Wilmington with Uncle Frank. There's good jobs down there, honey. When I get enough, we're going to set up. We're going to get a nice place for you, Mom, Val, and Jimmy down. I remember thinking, that stinks, but my dad said it was going to be okay, so I knew it was going to be okay. Wasn't until I got in my late 20s, I realized the longer walk my dad made was into my grandfather Finnegan, Ambrose Finnegan's pantry, with uh, my mom's brothers. And I said, Ambrose, I need a favor. My dad was a proud, decent man. I need a favor, Ambrose. Can you keep, can you keep Gene and the kids? It'll be about a year, but I promise promise I'll make good on it. Too damn many people have had to do that. This is more than about the economy. That's not who the hell we are. The president said, and he meant it, when he said it, rebuilding the middle class, restoring the middle class is the defining issue of our time. Because folks, when the middle class does well, the poor have a shot. There's a little bit of hope. And the wealthy do very well. The wealthy do very well. Let me make something clear to you. I don't believe the middle class is a number. I have a lot of first-rate economists that work for me, work for the president. Economists tend to say middle class is $49,870 or $52,000. That's not what the middle class is. Middle class in America is a way of life. It's a point of view, it's a value set. It's about being able to own your home and not just rent it. It's about being able to live in a safe neighborhood where you know your kid can walk the streets, go to the playground, and go to a school that is just good enough, you know, if they do well, they can qualify to get to college, and if they qualify to get to college, you have a shot of sending them. Do you know anybody? Black or white, Hispanic, rich, poor, that doesn't dream of their kid going to college? I've not met anybody. I've not met anybody. And I love my Republican friends at Romney talking about how we, somehow, we have these sort of cabin views. We have wealth envy. Give me a break. I grew up in a neighborhood where my mother and father never doubted that if I wanted to be president of the United States, I could be it. If my brother wanted to be a millionaire, he had a shot at making it. If my sister wanted to run a company, she could. Middle class folks don't have cabin dreams. But damn it, you got to make it there to have a chance for any of your dreams to come true. And folks, I just don't understand. I don't understand why these guys don't understand. Look, you know, uh, for us, it's, uh, it's about just being able to do the things I said and uh, maybe help your parents. All of you, not all of you, most of you who are part of the baby boom generation, or even younger, are getting used to having to uh, help your mom and dad, or your mom or your dad. I love these guys, how they try to pit us against. They tell everybody we got to cut Social Security, which Romney's budget does, the cap, you know, cap and uh, the, uh, the budget proposal he has, or cut Medicare, as if somehow, as if somehow that's going to help people who are younger have it available to them. Do you know anybody, if their mom can't afford the prescription, isn't going to figure a way to pay for it, even if it means cutting what they have on the table, even if it means changing their way of life? Do you know anybody like that? Do you know anybody who makes the judgment, yeah, do less for my parents, so I'm going to have some. Do you know anybody 
your mother or father who want to have to rely on you, who want to have to, who, who, who don't feel horrible if they think the help you're giving them is coming at the expense of their grandkids or at the expense of their standard. Man, this is not, these guys didn't come from my neighborhood. I mean it. And I think most Americans get it. So folks, look, I think it gets down to what I said at the outset. It's about dignity. It's about being able to turn to your child like my dad did to me and say, honey, it's going to be okay. That's the objective. And literally the president I talk, that's the objective we have. At the end of the day, you can really walk in and sit down with your kid and say, honey, it's going to be okay. And mean it. And how many people do you know that you grew up with have absolute confidence that they can turn to their kids today and say, honey, it's going to be okay. Look, you know as well as I do, it's not just the economy. It's the most important issue. We're in a, we're in a town of a raging Cajun who made famous the phrase, it's the economy, stupid, it's the economy. It is, but it's more. It's also about America's place in the world, our foreign policy. It's also about how we treat one another, our social policy. It's about what kind of country we're going to leave our kids. Imagine, imagine, what the Supreme Court would look like. And so much more. Imagine what our foreign policy would look like if there were four years of Romney. You don't have to imagine Ron much. He's already told us a lot. He said he'd use the Soviet Union, and then he says Russia as the most significant geopolitical foe America has. He says we should still have combat troops in Iraq. He says it's a mistake for the United States to lead the rest of the world in laying out a policy of turning over responsibility to the Afghans so we can bring American troops home after the longest war in American history. He says he wouldn't have supported the New START Treaty. Folks, we're going to have a lot of time to debate these issues. But I believe the differences in this election are stark. I believe Romney and what I refer to as the new Republican Party because this ain't your father's Republican Party. I believe their social policy, I mean this sincerely, and I'm going to have to defend this in front of all press people, but I believe their social policy is a throwback to the 50s. I believe their foreign policy, I believe their foreign policy is a relic of the Cold War. And I believe their economic policy has a little more than doubled down on the failed policies of the previous administration. So I think the choice is stark. The choice is stark. We deserve to be judged based on our positions. But I think the consequences are obvious. And maybe the majority of people don't agree with us. And that's what elections are about. But folks, I believe we're going to win. I believe we're going to win for three basic reasons. One, we have the strongest candidate. Ladies and gentlemen, the presidential election is unique among all elections, not in terms of the power of state, but in the measure that people assign, the minimum requirement they call for. And it calls for strength of character and con conviction, a belief that you will do what you say, that you stand by what you say. The second reason they're going to win is, as I said before, the Republicans aren't hiding the ball, as my mother would say, God love them. God love them. We're saying exactly what they No more compassionate conservatism. No more rescue the public school system. No, just straight up. They're saying what they believe. And ladies and gentlemen, I also believe, like all important elections, it only comes down to a choice, not a referendum. And let me leave you with a quote from a, a guy that uh, um, I knew and just passed away uh, um, last at uh, the uh, began the spring. His name was Kevin White. He was the mayor of Boston. He was the new phenom. He was the Barack Obama of mayors, the John Lindsay of mayors back in 1970 who got elected in Boston. 
1973, as a 31 year old, almost 32 year old senator, I was asked to, uh, to go up and be in the son of Captain Eugenia Finnegan Biden. I thought it was a little heavy. The first major speech I was asked to give was Teddy Kennedy asked me to address the John F. Kennedy dinner in Boston, which entitled me to being, uh, to, to sing with my family. And I remember being up in the, uh, I think it was the uh, Copley Hotel, and, um, and I was shaving and then putting on my tie and the television camera, the television set was on. And I was rehearsing what I was going to be saying to myself at the time I tie in the mirror. And, and uh, in the meantime, since White had gotten elected, there was a national recession and Boston was in trouble and he was in trouble going into his re-election year. And he walked out of his office and like all governors and mayors for their harder jobs, you all are able to impartune them, as they say, as they walk out of their offices in City Hall and the Capitol. And it was a live news shot on whatever WBZ or whatever the channel was. And a horde of press folks descended upon him. I don't know who it was. Six, eight, ten, I don't remember. It just seemed like a lot at the time. And they put the boom mics out, and they had their mics out. And they essentially asked the same question. Okay, wise guy, how are you doing now? And I'll forget what he said. And I just would suggest to you all keep it in mind as you judge us and look and report on us. He stepped back, put up his arms, and he said, Folks, look, don't compare me to the Almighty. Compare me to the alternative. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an alternative now. That's what this race will be about. Thank you all for having me, and may God protect our troops. Thank you very much. Enjoy New Orleans. <laughs> Thank you.